Howdy, y'all. Mr. Cosby coming to you from beautiful Itascacita, Texas, with another chemistry lesson. And today we're going to talk about the hybridization of atomic orbitals and the valence bond theory. In this lesson, the valence bond theory, the hybridization, the hybrid orbitals, and much, much more. You will need your periodic table, and you need to be familiar with the Vesper theory, molecular shapes, Lewis dot symbols, the orbital shapes, and electron configuration. And if you're not sure of any of these areas, you need to go to my YouTube channel, find the lesson, and check it out because it's a must to know these items. All right, if you remember the Vesper theory, told us that the shape of a molecule was determined by the repulsion of the bonds and the electron pairs, or the electron regions, and it would be most stable when these regions were as far apart as possible. And this worked fairly well, but it couldn't explain why boron had three equal bonds, or why carbon had four equal bonds, or even why phosphorus could form five equal bonds, or the fact that it could do five bonds when we know it's supposed to be three. But with quantum mechanics, we were able to introduce the valence bond theory. And the valence bond theory described how the molecular shapes and molecular orbitals are formed by uh, the hybridization of the atomic orbitals. And this was used to explain how atoms can have bonds of equal energy even though the electrons are in orbitals with different energies, such as s, p, or d orbitals. So let's look at uh, carbon. Carbon is a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 electron configuration. It has four valence electrons, and its lowest dot symbol looks something like this. We have a 1s orbital and three p orbitals. But when it bonds, we end up with four equal bonds. How? Well, hybridization is the answer to that question. Hybridization is the mixing of an unequal or a set of unequal orbitals to obtain a new set of equal orbitals. And this new set has properties somewhere between the original unequal orbital. Let's understand orbital hybridization. The first part is hybridization occurs on the central atom. So if we look at something like methane, carbon is the central atom, and that's where we expect hybridization to occur. Secondly, the number of new hybrid orbitals always equals the number of orbitals used. We can have one s orbital and one p orbital, and that will give us two sp orbitals, two brand new orbitals. Or how about 1s orbital, 3p orbitals, and 1d orbital. That would give us five sp3d orbitals, or five new orbitals. Part three, the new orbitals name will consist of the number and kind of orbitals hybridized. So if you have an s and a p, you're going to have two sp's or an S with three P's and one D, count them up and it will give us five SP3Ds uh, would be a new name and the three would be telling us how many P orbitals there are. And then in our four fourth part here, both the energy and the shape are changed in the new orbitals. So a one S plus a one P, of course, will give us this new shape for the two SP somewhere in between the uh, two originals. Hybrid orbital shapes. If we have an S plus a P, we get two SP, and that's going to look something like this, and that's linear. Now, if we have an S and two Ps, that's going to give us three SP2s, and that's going to look like uh, this, and that's trigonal planar. Now, an S and three Ps will give us four SP3s, and I think you can already... Uh, figure out that that's tetrahedral. Now we have an S, three P's, and a D. They're going to combine and give us five SP3Ds, and it's going to look something like this, and of course that's trigonal bipyramidal. Now we have an S plus three P's plus two D's. Add them up, we get six brand new SP3 
D2s, which would look something like this and is considered octahedral. Just a little bit of review there. The, two S, uh, the SPs are going to be linear. The SP2s are going to be trigonal planar. The SP3s are going to be tetrahedral. The SP3D is going to give us a trigonal bipyramidal. And the SP3D uh, or the SP3D2s are octahedral. Now remember, hybridization doesn't always occur, such as on hydrogen, fluorine, and chlorine. They only have one bond and really don't need to hybridize. So let's look at some examples of hybridization. Beryllium has a, a electron configuration and two outer shell electrons, but we know that it makes two equal bonds. So what happens here is even though this is our Lewis dot symbol, when it bonds, we get these two separate bonds and they're equal. Therefore, there must be some hybridization. And so one of the S's jump up into the P's and then they combine to give us two brand new SP2 or SP's. And it's a linear molecule. Let's look at another example. Carbon. And we see that it has four valence electrons, two in the S and two in the P's. But we know that even though this is the Lewis dot symbol, when it bonds, we get something that looks like this. Therefore, one of the S's jumps up into the empty P and these all combine to give us a brand new set of sp3s and of course that's a tetrahedral molecule and this is how phosphorus would occur i'm going to use the shorthand here and we see that it has five valence electrons but would only produce three bonds so the Lewis dot symbol, three bonds, not five. So how could it possibly make five bonds? Well, we borrow from the three Ds. One of the S's jumps up there. And now we have five orbitals to make five bonds. So a 1S and 3P and 1D will give us five brand new SP3Ds. And it should look something like this. And that's trigonal bipyramidal. All right, let's recap. The Vesper theory can't do it all, so we came up with the valence bond theory, which introduced the idea of hybridization and hybrid orbitals, and that gives us our shapes, or helps explain uh, the shapes with the Vesper model as well. If you have any questions, send an email to mrkazi at mrkazi.com, and be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel.